We are having a hymn sing-along, so any requests? 380-380. What's the name of that one, John? There is within my heart a melody. 380. Seven hundred. Seven hundred. We didn't. That was great. Yeah. I d I've never. I've never sung that one. Richard, what's the name? Abide with me.
369. All right, our last four. 369. 369. What's the name of that one, Kathy? Blessed Assurance. Excellent. Our last one, 369. And blessed We'll be doing a hymn sing-along at 10.45 in the morning, so our next one will be September 10th. September 10th. Um, so 10.45, so bring a list of song, uh, hymns that you haven't heard, um, but just really would like to hear. So, all right, thank you for, for being here this morning. We at Oaklawn UMC. 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 We at Oaklawn UMC believe that everyone deserves to be loved, heard, affirmed, and respected. respected. We at Oaklawn UMC believe that as a church, it is possible to offer this to one another. When we listen, learn, appreciate diversity, and, and love, love God above all else, and, and our, our neighbors, neighbors as, as ourselves. Therefore, as individual parts of the church, we pledge to move towards this corporate reality so that the church can be a voice for the voiceless, a home for the wanderer, a respite for the weary, a balm for the hurting, God's presence in the world.
Good morning, Oakland. Good morning. I'm so happy to see you and be back. I've been out on adventures, whether you're with us in person or online. I hope you've been having fun over your summer. Um, my name's Taylor. I'm the lay leader here at Oakland, and I've got a couple quick announcements before we get started with worship. Um, the first is, if this is your first, third, fifth time being here, we'd love that if you could fill out a connect card. You can scan the QR code, or you can find it in your bulletin. Um, portions of this service will be in English and Spanish, so if you need a translation for either of those languages, you can also use our translation app. Um, you can scan the QR code for that as well. Um, this week, on Monday, we're starting a new book and book club. It's Queering Wesley, Queering the Church. Um, you don't have to read this week to join, um, so it's a good time to jump in. Um, Pastor Ryan will be teaching this book. Um, you can join on Zoom or in the parlor. It starts at 6 p.m. Um, we'd love to have you there. There's some volunteer opportunities this week, like there are every week. Um, community meal is Tuesday through Thursday, um, and we need people to help serve our unsheltered neighbors. And then we have a migrant bus coming in Monday and Friday. So if you could join us for either of those, we'd really love to have you. You can scan the QR code to find out more details about that. Um, and lastly, um, we need some help with Cafe o Later. Sign up um, to help serve, make coffee, that sort of thing, because we all like to chit-chat afterwards. So we need some help uh, getting that set up. So if you could sign up for that, we would appreciate it. Um, and make sure to join us there after church today. Um, with that, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning. Let me invite you to stand as you're able as we join together in the call to worship. You'll find the words on the front of your worship bulletin and they'll be on the screen. Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. The one who gives us peace in the storm. The one who is present in our darkness. The one who overcomes that which would harm us. The one who reminds us do not be afraid. The one who declares, do not let your hearts be troubled. Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. This, beloved, is Jesus. Let me invite you to remain standing as you're able as we uh, sing our opening hymn, uh, number 534 in the blue hymnal, Be Still My Soul.
we're going to invite all the children to come to the front and we're going to invite Dorothy. kids for a minute and I was telling these guys that I was doing the story time today that I didn't know what I was going to say but you know that Pastor Ryan gave it to me and this one here says to me well if you don't have something to tell us how will we learn anything so I still don't really have a lesson so my lesson to you would be to always be prepared I never am Nobody's laughing. People usually, people usually laugh at me. <laughs> okay. What I wanted to do with the kids today is show them the new bags that we've been making. So, because the kids are all different ages, I thought we should have all different bags. This would be more for, um, for hope. Let's find some of the bigger ones. The older ones. We made felt boards. Nice, quiet entertainment. Coloring sheets that go with the sermon. Of course, I'll get all this out and I won't have any bags left. You what? What did he say? I didn't draw those. Hey, you could cut some felt out. Oh, okay. Well, you can draw too. Um, here's true and false books. Nothing to do with church, but I thought the older kids would like them. Wait, can I have this? No. <laughs> no, we're going to get a stamp that says property of. I, I've heard we have one. No, not of you, Danny. We have um, colored pencils. They don't break like the crayons. better stuff down here. I put it upside down. Do any of you speak Spanish? No. Okay. Well, here's a Bible that is in Spanish and English. Because I've heard I have to be all inclusive in this church. It's one of the first things I learned. It has all the different stories. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's got pictures. Well, you know, I had a chapter book. Are these for, like, today? Or are these for, like... Yeah, these are for today. And what I'd like to start doing is have you take your, your bag um, to work on when the sermon starts. Because let's face it, before the sermon, you stand up, you sit down... You glad hand every you can get up and do all that, right? And then when the sermon starts and you don't want to listen to Ryan, um, you have something else to do. I know. For a whole 20 minutes. No. 
Um, so then I have one pack here with a bunch of books that I picked up. Yeah. Um, to, it, I have today's worship bulletin, which is not about the lesson, but I also have the lesson that he's going to preach on in print. You can have those ahead of time. And I would also like to see when you take a bag to put everything back in the bag. Most of them have, um, they may all have felt boards now. You can take. Yeah, those, these are um, colorings of what you already have in color. Um, do y'all start school this week? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Well, Okay, well you can still do this next part. Um, can I get one of you to pray over our kids for a good, successful, and fun year? Let's, let's pray for our, our kids going back to school. Oh no, I gotta get up now. <laughs> I can't get up. Yeah, story of my life. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, come on guys. So, how cool is that that you're going to have a bag, a different bag, and you can choose one each time that you're here, so, and you don't know what you're going to find out in that bag, so, that's cool. You got a lot of surprises. Huh? Wait, thank you. Hey, it's always a surprise, so, <laughs> let us pray together. Dear God, we thank you for this wonderful moment and children that they are here. And for those who are not here, but they are online or they're everywhere that they are, please take care of them. Be with them in each step on this new academic year. Be with the professors, be with the, all the people that is involved, all the volunteers in schools, and surround them with your love and your kindness and respect for each other. Surround them with the protection that you only can provide for them, God. And we ask you that each time when they step in school and they come to church, they can be joyful and they can enjoy all the surprises of learning and knowledge that they're going to gain each time. Amen. Amen. And in that love and kindness and respect and everything, let us rise as we able and let us exchange the peace and let us um, say hi and love each other.
technical difficulties are not allowing us to show the video, but we have one wonderful person here. Dustin, yes, come here. <laughs> and the video, okay, it's working, I guess coming. But in the meantime, you know what we do here at Oakland. Uh, and if you don't know, there is a good way to learn about what we do. And you can go through Dallas Response and you can see all the ministries in outreach and all the worship. I mean, you can go on our webpage as well. So, and you can learn everything that we do. The Holy Pineapple will well appreciate it. Um, hi, my name is Dustin. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I've been coming pretty regularly, approaching a year. Um, back in December, I volunteered for my first time at Shelter, and it was pretty much a point in my life that things changed uh, for... Oh, and I didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, oh, yes. Uh, so I work in the interior design industry, and... Um, what I was left with coming away that night was how can I marry what I do for a living with what the church's mission is. And so through a series of events, um, my boss, um, Angeline Guido Design, um, allowed me to develop a project called Dallas Walks the Walk, which is a coalition of five design firms who are all coming together to revamp the first floor of this building for a better use of space and energy for the volunteers, for all the community service projects that are happening. Um, um, we've been very lucky that Benjamin Moore and Texas Paint has come on as our official paint sponsor. Um, we've got other partnerships possibly in the works, and I'm looking forward to seeing how those will develop. Um, and as this project grew, we were able to expand our reach to this area right behind the sanctuary and to the parlor. Um, some of us lovingly call it Grandma's living room uh, back there. Uh, Cody even said he uh, called it the funeral parlor. So essentially what we're, we're going to do is try to give all of this space a new life and new energy. So more people will want to celebrate their weddings here. More people will want to to find sanctuary and refuge and celebration all within these walls. And so the design firms that are participating are Angeline Guido Design, Yates Design, Fond Interiors, Amy Joyce Design, and um, we have several contractors who have also come on board to partner with us. And so if you don't know the interior design world or know or been through a home remodel, this is going to be a massive undertaking and the amount of generosity given by the community and people who have no ties to this church but fully believe in what the mission is of Oaklawn and Dallas Response has been overwhelming. So just sit by patiently. There will be probably ways to get involved in some capacity and uh, we're hoping by the end of the new year, we're going to have a whole new place to come together.
mismo día, cuando llegó la noche, Jesús les dijo a sus discípulos, vamos al otro lado del lago. Entonces, dejaron a la gente y atravesaron el lago en una barca y algunos fueron en otras barcas. De pronto, se desató una tormenta, el viento soplaba tan fuerte que las olas se metían en la barca y ésta empezó a llenarse de agua. Entre tanto, Jesús se había quedado dormido en la parte de atrás de la barca, recostado sobre una almohada, los discípulos lo despertaron y le gritaron, Maestro, ¿no te importa que, no estemos, que nos estemos hundiendo? Jesús se levantó y ordenó al viento y al mar que se calmaran. Enseguida, el viento se calmó y todo quedó completamente tranquilo. Entonces, Jesús dijo a sus discípulos, ¿por qué están tan asustados? Todavía no confían en mí, pero ellos estaban muy asombrados y se decían unos a otros, ¿Quién es este hombre que hasta el viento y el mar le obedecen? La palabra de Dios. Before I get started, I want to recognize that the choir is back. A round of applause for the choir. Next week, you'll be able to see them uh, with no palm trees between them and you. Um, this is the last week of Chosen uh, Family Summer Vacation. Uh, and so today we are, uh, as you recall, throughout the summer, we've been uh, talking about, we've been kind of following a flavor, if you haven't heard, if you haven't noticed, of uh, adult uh, vacation Bible school. So reliving some of those childhood stories um, and how they can apply to our lives today. Um, we've enjoyed it. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Next week, uh, we migrate to an a interim series. Uh, for the next few weeks, and we're really excited to introduce some even um, cooler uh, topics uh, of today and some uh, infusing some new voices into the preaching schedule, so can't wait. Um, we are trying to figure out how we will keep the Holy Pineapple in the next altarscape, so don't worry, those of you that have loved the pineapple, we're working on getting that to stay. Harvey, Ingrid, Sandy, Katrina, Ida. They sound like names you would hear at a cocktail party that my parents would throw in the 1950s. But we know them in a very different context, don't we? These are the names of some of the most devastating hurricanes in history to have impacted the South. Storms whose effect on the lives of people continue long after the clouds have parted long after the floods have receded and the winds have died down. We watch with horror the devastation wrought by Hurricane Harvey on the Gulf Coast just a few years ago and Katrina before that. Interstates in Houston became a surging rapid. Islands in the Caribbean, like Puerto Rico, lost most of their infrastructure. Harvey was soon followed by Irma, which hit the Caribbean again and then turned her wrath on Florida. Recovery from these storms, especially in Puerto Rico, as we read the news today, or as friends of ours visit there, we understand that they, are continue, they continue to feel the devastation of that storm. The storm recovery takes many years, but the memories linger of those storms forever. Naming storms is something that humans have been doing for a really long time. And in a practical sense, if you think about it, it makes sense to name them to reduce confusion if multiple storms hit at once. It's been a long time practice. Even in the 19th century, um, we know that uh, hurricanes were often named after saints in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, Hurricane Santa Ana that struck Puerto Rico in the 1800s. And during World War II, a group of American soldiers uh, named hurricanes in the Pacific after the names of their spouses, which we'll only think of as a term of endearment and love <laughs> and affection. While reducing confusion may be the official reason, something psychological is in play when a name 
is associated to a force that threatens us. The word hurricane itself is derived from a word in the Spanish language, which I will not try to pronounce to you today. But it was inspired by the Mayan storm god Hurricane. Ancient peoples often put names to forces of nature that were mysterious and destructive as a way of attempting to control or manipulate them. Of course, you can't control a hurricane, but naming it at least gives us a way of identifying a common natural enemy. The fishermen of Galilee didn't put names to the many storms that came streaming out of the Valley of the Doves on the western shore. They weren't pagan, so they didn't believe that the forces of nature were throwing a tantrum. As Jews, they believed in one creator, God. But they also knew that these storms were a real threat to their lives and their livelihoods. While they didn't give names to them, they knew that whenever a squall blew up on the lake, it was a reminder that they were still subject to the forces of chaos and death. In fact, in much of scripture, the sea represents catastrophe. The Israelites weren't really a sea-loving people, so that vast Mediterranean sea to the west, and even the smaller seas like Galilee, where the fishermen usually kept their boats close together, represented the unknown. The dark, the dark deep, the place where the terrible sea monsters waited to devour. The sea was the place from which people never returned. All we have to do is turn back to the first verses of Genesis to see that the sea represents chaos. When God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without shape or form. It was dark over the deep sea, and God's wind swept over the waters, says Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Darkness, wind, deep, and the image of a churning storm. And yet, in the midst of the storm, stormy chaos, God begins to separate things out. He brings light to pierce the darkness, to separate the waters and the waters from the land. The creation story is how God begins to bring order out of chaos. It's not coincidence, it's no coincidence that the first major story after creation is yet another boat story. Noah is a righteous man who obeys God, builds a huge ship, and prepares for God's judgment. Speaking of vacation Bible school, we all sung about Noah in vacation Bible school. God allows the chaos of the waters to break loose in a horrific flood, reverting back the watery word to the watery void of the Genesis story that we just mentioned. And yet, while the waters rage, God saves Noah. God saves Noah's family and the creation of the earth on an ark tossed by stormy seas. God's grace and God's rescue come together on a boat. Noah steps out of the ark into a new creation washed clean by the, by the flood. Chaos is pushed back again. Other Bible stories give us the same examples. The Exodus story of God parting the waters of the Red Sea to save Israel from the evil of slavery in Egypt. The story of Isaiah, looking forward to a day when all can come to the waters and drink without fear. The story of Jonah that we heard about this summer, tossed into the raging sea but saved by the belly of a whale. The story of Jesus going through the waters of baptism and into the desert to do battle with the forces of evil. Scripture is full of stories of how God brings the people of God through raging waters into a new creation. It's no accident then that Mark in our story today preserves the story of Jesus and his disciples in a boat being tossed by an unexpected and violent storm. The chaos rages once again in a rickety boat and are swamped by ten-foot waves that are starting to sink. Fear, panic, and desperation come over the fishermen 
who have clearly never experienced this type of storm. Mark tells us that in the midst of all the chaos, Jesus is in the stern of the boat, napping quietly on a cushion. The disciples, meanwhile, are in a panic. Jesus apparently doesn't sense the chaos, the evil that surrounds them. And so they are concerned. Wake up, they yell over the howling wind. Don't you see that we're dying? Don't you care? Jesus wakes up and maybe looks at them for a long moment with one eye open. He doesn't answer the question. Instead, he stands and addresses the wind and the waves. Mark says that he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Isn't it interesting that these are roughly the same words that Jesus used to cast out a demon? He rebukes them and tells them to be quiet. It's no coincidence that the next scene in Mark is Jesus casting out a demon on the other side of the lake. Mark, as well as the other Gospels, make it clear. Jesus has command over the wind, the waves, the chaos, the confusion, and despair. We might expect Jesus to give his disciples an explanation of how he did that. How did he calm the storm? How did he turn a violent, raging sea into a serene pond of tranquility? We might expect a presentation in 2023 outlining Jesus' humanity and divinity. We might even expect Jesus to smile and go back to sleep leaving the disciples to wonder about what they had just seen. But rather than riff on the display of power, Jesus instead turns and asks the question, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? You have to wonder if the disciples were thinking something like, Duh, of course we're afraid. We're in a category store uh, by a hurricane. We almost died. And then he stands in a boat, raises his hands like Moses over the Red Sea, and the forces of nature obey him. So yes, we were afraid. In their fear, however, the disciples had forgotten one important fact. Jesus was in the boat with them. They they woke Jesus up so that he could share in their panic. Jesus, on the other hand, wants them to have faith, not fear. Always remember, I am in the boat with you, Jesus says, in effect, and I've got this. The storm hits us too, often with great fury. Many devastating hurricanes can hit our lives no matter where we live. Hurricane cancer, hurricane surgery, Hurricane new job. Hurricane trouble with finances. Hurricane new school year. Hurricane family illness. If you're like me, you're naming your hurricane in your head right now. And so where is Jesus? Where is God in the midst of these storms? Where is God when the typhoon of devastating illness hits? Where is Jesus when the lightning strike of a loved one's death leaves us in shock? Where is God when the waves of death, destruction, and doubt threaten to sink sink us? Where is God? In the boat with us. And there he invites us to turn from fear to faith. The kind of faith that Jesus himself had in the God who brings order out of chaos. God does not promise to claim every storm in our lives, but God does promise to calm you in every storm of life. Wilma Mankiller is honored and recognized as the first female principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. She's also the first woman elected as chief of a major native tribe. She spent her remarkable life fighting for the rights of American Indians. She was born in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, the capital of the Cherokee Nation. Pastor Rachel has a piece of artwork from her that was given to her by Chuck hanging in her kitchen. And when I saw that it was preachable for this topic about storms, 
I may have ripped it off her wall and stole it, but don't worry, Chuck, I put it back. The inscription on the artwork, though, really touched me, and I want to share that with you this morning. The first one reads, Cows run away from the storms while the buffalo charges toward it and gets through it quicker. Whenever I am confronted by a tough challenge, I do not prolong the torment. I become the buffalo. I wish I was as brave as her. I wish I could become the buffalo. I lived in Oklahoma for a while, and storms were there are different because there are no hills, there are no mountains. You literally see the storm coming at you. Here are some excerpts of the rest of what Wilma writes on the back of that artwork. The buffalo's way of dealing with storms remind us to have courage and face challenges head on. Perhaps the most necessary trait needed to charge through our storms is hope. The white buffalo is a sacred symbol of hope to the Native Americans of the plains. Such a buffalo came to the Lakota Sioux at a time when all seemed hopeless. Through trust and prayer, their dire situation was remedied. Listen to this. Hope propels us into and through our storms. God does not promise to calm every storm in our life. God does promise to calm us in every storm of life. Jesus will still be in that boat. Many of us, as we talked about, are facing serious storms with memorable names. We are afraid, and, right, and rightfully so. But we can put, out, put our faith in the one who lived and died by faith. We see the wind and the waves, but can we focus our eyes on God? The one whom the wind and the waves ultimately obey. When my ship is tossed, my mind is programmed to only think of the impending doom. I think many of you can relate to that. 